we're going to be talking about discussing your ancestors in New Zealand. Uh, some of you may imagine all of the lovely places that they had in New Zealand in Lord of the Rings and uh, some other of the movies that may have been out there. And uh, yes, it has some lovely places, but it also has a couple of big cities. So it's uh, uh, quite, an, uh, quite an interesting country. And we'll get moving here. To start out, we understand or need to understand that genealogical research is a mixture of history, geography, linguistics, and paleography. Um, it, it's inevitable when you're doing genealogical research that you'll run into one of these. History is the most important. You really, really need to understand the history of the countries that you have uh, do your research in. And that includes the United States of America. And uh, if you are interested in, if you are going back in time, you need to be aware of boundary changes, uh, county changes, uh, states being created, uh, the, the uh, Revolutionary War, uh, the colonies, all of those things in history are very important impact the kinds of records that were created and the places where those records will be located ultimately today. So all of that uh, goes into the history. The geography is important because without knowing the exact place where one of your ancestors lived, you're basically floating out in space without any kind of tether. Or a better an example is, and the one I always give is, uh, you go out in the middle of, the, of a huge lake in a rowboat with a gun and you start shooting into the water to see if you can catch a fish. And the answer is, well, you might hit a fish, but the chances you hit your fish are very, very, very slim. And uh, even if you do, you're not gonna catch them. And that's the, the, the problem with ignoring the places. So one of the things that uh, is commonly uh, something that's just the basis of everything I do every day when I go through and, and work with, uh, with doing research or preparing a, a presentation or whatever is to always go to the place first, always check to see the places are valid and that they match up with whatever historical sources that we've found. And then we're getting into the languages and paleography, which is the study of old handwriting. So the handwriting becomes important. The further back you go, even if you start out in English, by the time you go back a few, uh, centuries, you'll find out that the language is no longer the same. And if you're doing uh, church records, you will undoubtedly back, go, going back far enough, you'll always hit Latin in, East, in Western Europe. And in other places, obviously, you already start out with other languages. And hopefully what we're doing here, of course, with New Zealand is we have at least a basis in English language. Another thing that's important is always know the specific location of all the events in your ancestor's life. Don't just keep assuming that because you find another uh, event for somebody named uh, John Doe or Richard Rowe or whatever, and that's your ancestor, that that's the same person, even if they live in about the same place. So most of the time when you're doing research, we need to go down to the house level. We really need to identify the exact location of the farm or the house or the, or whatever, where the person lived. And that's doubly important in uh, England and, and uh, in Scotland and Rope Wales and uh, all of the British derivatives like Arge uh, Canada, um, Australia and New Zealand. Okay, there's a quote that I like to use and that's a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin and culture is like a tree without roots. And gathering names in, real, in genealogy uh, has uh, somewhat of an attraction, but it really becomes part of your life when you begin to understand the history and the origin and the culture of the people that you're researching. And your people, the culture may be entirely different than yours. Uh, you may trace your ancestors back to some, uh, some German immigrants in Pennsylvania, or you may end up with uh, Scottish or Irish uh, immigrants in Kentucky and up in the hills of uh, 
Virginia and North Carolina. So you just really got to be aware of, of this kind of background that's so important about places. So now we're gonna go right into it with New Zealand. The first Polynesians arrived in New Zealand about 800 AD. So they were immigrants and uh, there isn't, there, there, there's just not to seem to be a lot of artifacts previous that I haven't read that anybody came there. So it was pretty much a unknown country until the Maoris arrived in, the, in that early part of the of 800 AD. That's really quite current by the way, because um, if, if you ever get a chance to travel in Europe or you've done any traveling in Europe, you'll, you'll soon find out that many of the buildings and structures you're looking at date back uh, at least that far. Some of them uh, are considerably older than that. Abel Tasman, of course, you'll recognize the name if you know about a little bit of the geography of Tasmania, which is a big island just to the south of Australia. He was the first European to cite the country. That's the tradition, at least. And that's a person who uh, they understand. So then, of course, you have Captain Cook. Captain James Cook was the first European to explore New Zealand. Actually, didn't just look at it. He, yeah, he went and landed on the, on the island. Uh, Captain Cook has a very uh, interesting and storied life. Uh, unfortunately, it was cut right short when he landed in Hawaii and got involved with a dispute with the native Hawaiians and they killed him. So he uh, died in, uh, in the middle. His, fortunately, all of his discoveries and everything uh, were still on board the ship and uh, they, they managed to take those back to England. So the first European settlers arrived in Russell, which is a, a port in, uh, in, Aust in New Zealand in 1809 for the first, first permanent settlement. And then we jump ahead because a lot of things just happened and people, it, the Europeans began uh, coming in droves. Uh, it, was, uh, it was another place uh, for Europeans to come. Uh, either free Europeans or transported Europeans, meaning people who were convicted of crimes and shipped. But most of the transports went to, uh, to Australia. And uh, a lot of the, and some of the free people, a lot of the free people came to New Zealand. It was established as a separate British crown colony in 1841. And then was uh, given a government in 1852, so they began with a constitutional government in 18. One of the big things that happened in, uh, in New Zealand was the um, occurrence of the um, gold rush in 1860s. And um, they had a gold rush in Australia, they had a gold rush in California, and they had a gold rush in New Zealand, and they had a gold rush in Alaska. And so there's lots of these historical things that you'll, you'll find uh, created a, a, a rather large uh, movement of population into the thousands and thousands of people. Not just the people who went out in the tents and dug the gold, but the people who, who uh, profited from that by um, having their, um, all of their activities uh, supported by stores and industrial and shipping and everything else that went along with that. So it was a, it was a fairly substantial impact on the country. New Zealand chose not to take part in the Federation of, Ar of Australia. This was something that was offered uh, for a, a political movement to make Australia and New Zealand uh, a federation and it became the dominion of New Zealand in 1907. And then as the dominion of New Zealand, it, um, had, it became a constitutional monarchy with a parliamentary form of government. So basically the history of, of, of uh, New Zealand is fairly st straightforward. <clears throat> It's, uh, it's had conflicts, it had very serious conflicts between the uh, 
English settlers and the uh, indigenous people, the Maoris. And they were, uh, that was a very severe uh, conflict. And there were in internal warfare among the Maoris also. But by and large, compared to many other countries, New Zealand's history has been rather um, uh, peaceful over the many years. Uh, there've been uh, there've been volcanoes. There's been uh, earthquakes. There's been other things, uh, uh, typhoons, other things that uh, make life interesting down there. The archives of New Zealand are, and I'm not going to go through all of the Maori, but Te Rua Mahara at Ote Kawantanga has has about seven million documents, dating from about 1840. So there's a, a, a substantial archive. Uh, part of that is, uh, is digitized and a lot of the records are digitized and available. And so we'll get into the, to the digital records. When you're going to do research in uh, both Australia and New Zealand, it's a good idea to start with uh, these four websites, Ancestry, Family Search, My Heritage and Find My Past. Uh, just kind of a brief, look at which ones have what. Family Search has a, a tremendously large collection of records, most of which are um, uh, available. Uh, a lot of them are available digitized, but not the vast majority. The majority of the records on Family Search are still uh, either just plain digital images and unindexed or um, even a bunch of images that are neither cataloged nor indexed and are, are available. And I'll go into that a little bit more as we talk, as I talk a little later here. But uh, there's, it, just to be aware that you need to dig into family search and look at at least three different major areas before you get to the, before you can say you've actually done a search on family search for the records. Now, Ancestry has all the records digitized uh, Ancestry has a very good collection of English records and does have some Australian and New Zealand records. But Find My Past is the British uh, website, and it has the uh, records from a, a lot of records, millions and millions of records from the British Empire countries. So if you, if you think of Canada and Australia and New Zealand and, and South Africa and all the other, and India and all the other uh, areas that were part of the British Empire, then those are the records that are on Find My Past, which makes it extremely valuable. And, and I don't put any one of these above the others as far as being valuable, except for the fact that um, they, they reinforce each other. So you may find part of your records on Ancestry, different records on Family Search and another set of records that are different on Find My Past, all of which talk about the same people. So it's, it's just really interesting that you don't kind of hobble yourself by staying on only on family search or by only on ancestry or ignoring uh, one or the other, Find My Past. And you use all three of them in tandem. And then supplement this with My Heritage. My Heritage has focused in the last few years uh, of gathering records in, in uh, mainland Europe, so the, in the part of Europe. So they, their collections are uh, extremely extensive and complete for Scandinavia and uh, uh, reportedly has the best German set of records and some of the other areas in, uh, in, in continental Europe. So if you, uh, you, but it's very helpful always to go out and look for my heritage. You may find things there that you don't find any in any of the other lo other locations. So let's look at uh, another good record here, and that's the National Library of New Zealand. Um, it's important to understand when you go to countries of the world, or you go to any place. If you go to a state in the United States or the country of the United States or the country of England or the country of wherever, then there's going to be two things that are going to be constants for almost universally around the world. And that is they will have a library, an archive and a library. Now the, the difference, sometimes there's, a, there's kind of a, a, a 
fuzzy barrier or fuzzy difference between those two. Sometimes a state in the United States will keep some of its records in the library and some of its records in an archive. And it, it happens in the United States because we have records in, in the national archives, but we also have a tremendous resource in the Library of Congress, which is, the, which is the, uh, a, a huge library. And uh, so there's lots of places. And so each state, for example, uh, has a state archive. Uh, it may or may not be the active part of where you get the records. You may get the records from the state library or both. So uh, maybe they divide them up. Sometimes they divide them up into purely governmental records in the archives and all the other historical records in the library. Sometimes there's just back and forth. So you have to kind of know, uh, uh, investigate the holdings of each of these, but be aware that you want to find, as I pointed out here, there is a national archives in New Zealand, and now they also have a national li library. In this case, the National Library focuses more on the, uh, let's call it history kind of records, historic records that were created by people and, and uh, uh, the things that you would include in history, as opposed to the official records like marriage, death and, and records like that. And some of those records uh, obviously are going to be held in other cases, all, other places also. Um, in also in Austria, in uh, New Zealand, you have um, a very, very high uh, visibility uh, uh, participation in genealogy. Uh, in my understanding, in my experience, and my contacts back and forth, although somewhat limited, between me and people in New Zealand, not, not. Uh, uh, over the years, I've had a lot of contact, but it's been uh, off and on kind of contact with New Zealand. And the what I find is that there's just tremendous organization. They have local and local genealogical societies. They have a, a tremendous interest in genealogy in New Zealand. It's just lots. And so when you go to the uh, libraries, you find that they they all have a really good resources and this is the Auckland Council Libraries and they have uh, they start out with family history research guide and all sorts of the categories of researching and uh, finding your family in New Zealand. Now when I start when I give these examples for a specific country like New Zealand it's important to understand that you're going to get um, not just a um, uh, this from New Zealand, you're going to find these same kinds of, of organizations and records in, in most of the other countries of the world. It, and so basically, if you're not looking for a, a genealogical society, I learned this very, very, or very early when I started doing genealogical research and, and helping uh, many years ago in the, in the Mesa Family Search Library, because when we, uh, people would come in and they would ask things about, in one case, they came and asked about an island off the coast of Greece out in the Mediterranean and wanted to know if there's any way in the world they could trace their family history where their, their ancestors supposedly came from this island off the coast of Greece. And I don't even remember the name of the island, but one thing I do remember is that we that I looked at it and found out that they had a genealogical society on that island. And that was the key to that person's genealogy because they had people right there who would know where the records or if the records existed or where they might be. So don't don't discount the fact that there may be local organizations that can help you. And uh, in some cases, it may be to your benefit and their benefit for you to join the organization, join the, the, the local society. Now, here's, here's the, the kind of astonishing thing about New Zealand. And, and I, I, I don't know if they're unique because there are countries like Mexico that don't, that's had one census and that's it, that, uh, that was at it, that's at all helpful. Uh, not marginally, some of the others don't even have the, just have numbers, they don't have names. 
but there's only one, the 1930 census in Mexico. But this is an interesting thing, and you're going to have to go through this because it really is interesting. The population of New Zealand was enumerated from 1858 to the present, every 10 years, just like it has been in England and Australia and in Canada, except for the fact that everything before 1966 has been destroyed, except for a few of the Maori population. And the films are here are set out specifically. That's it. Think about it. There is no census records before 1966. And the ones after 1966 are not available until 2066. They may very well get destroyed before 2066 because that's their history. It was just amazing. No census records. Okay, so you're going to really have to, to rely on the, the records that do exist and find out and discover those records. Uh, so they use substitutes substitute lists like almanacs and directories, electoral rolls, property owners, occupants, juror lists, New Zealand electrical rolls, and school records. All of those kinds of records are more important in, in uh, New Zealand than uh, simply like in the United States, looking it up in the US census or in England, looking it up in the uh, uh, Scotland and English whale censuses. Okay. One thing they do have is migration records. And the migration records show clearly uh, uh, the people who have, who left primarily England and came to Australia. There are some people from Scotland and Wales, but primarily, and Ireland, Ireland but they're primarily from English derivation. And so from 1840 to the 1880s and other records, they're very, very good records. And I've found in doing research that they're very helpful because they do establish the fact that your ancestor did make it to New Zealand. And then you can begin looking for records locally of all the kinds of records that I've just mentioned that would help uh, in, in finding these people. Uh, military records are extremely uh, helpful. Now, what we have here is a copy of the uh, research wiki on familysearch.org. There's the research wiki. It's under the search tab uh, on the first page. And on the, on the uh, for each of the main pages of the wiki for each country and each area and each type of records, this sidebar uh, lists the types of records for each of the countries. So for here, for New Zealand, they have the whole list of uh, the records that are available and the, and the um, uh, interesting, and it will explain exactly what's available and what's not available in each one of these categories. So you can get started. And this is also a good checklist for uh, whether or not you are looking through all the types of records that may be available and, uh, and what kinds of records that you would need to, uh, to find the people that you're looking for. And this works for every country that uh, is listed in the, and almost all the countries are listed to some extent in uh, the research wiki. So it's a, it's a very good way to get into uh, what's, what's available and what's not available and uh, quickly determine whether or not you've, you've actually spent the time to look through those records and make sure that you have. Another great record set is the probate records. And uh, one of the things you can't do as a government, uh, you know, you throw away the census records, but you can't throw away the probate records. So why can't you throw away probate records? Because probate records are in the chain of title to the property in the country. And so any place that actually has a, an organization, a government that is able to, uh, uh, to regulate probate, the passage of property upon the death of a person, that particular body of records is extremely important and becomes uh, helpful in, in identifying families and identifying relationships. So it's, uh, you know, it's part of the whole process here. The process includes 
not only identifying the location, but then becoming aware, aware of all the records that occurred within the historical context. And looking at that as a like a cloud of records that you're going to uh, be able to, to look at. And as you work your way through this cloud of records, every time you meet one of those records, it will reinforce uh, whatever conclusions that you've made, or it will start you off on a different tangent because you'll find out that you're looking in the wrong place. And, and it becomes to the point where uh, going back in time, the probate records become almost usually become the deciding factor ultimately if they, if they exist in determining whether a, a particular family uh, exists or doesn't exist. Uh, many times, for, uh, as I've gone back doing research back step by step through the generations, it, it becomes harder and harder to establish parent child relationships. And when you get back far enough, that parent child relationship becomes may be, become very, very difficult because there are no consistent birth records and there's no consistent church records and there's no consistent, and everything else seems to have failed. And in that case, you start looking at almost exclusively for probate records, because if you can find the probate record for the person, that will give you that person's particular uh, family names, the people that they're related to. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one way, as I've gone back, for example, on my Tanner surname, that I've been able to uh, get to the point where I know that the, 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 the so far the, the documents end, we don't have anything going past a certain point, but the last record that, uh, that identified that last person in the line was a probate record. And that's the same thing that's gonna happen in uh, New Zealand is that there's going to be a lot of uh, probate records. And you'll see that this is a uh, page, a screenshot out of the um, archives the National Archives of New Zealand. So kind of coming back to the National Archives here and seeing that there's the probate records. Okay, let's see. Now, another thing that would be extremely helpful is newspapers. Um, now, I don't, uh, you know, th this is kind of the situation where uh, you look at newspapers uh, today, for example, uh, in the last year, I think I've seen one or maybe two paper copies of a newspaper. And they were because they were dropped on my front doorstep or in my driveway and I picked them up. Uh, basically, uh, some of us, maybe not all of us, but some of us have gone and many of the newspapers have gone. Uh, over to uh, to having digital only uh, online news and they no longer publish paper. Well, that's not the case as you go back in history, obviously. And uh, as a matter of fact, there is a very active uh, company um, in, in uh, New Zealand that uh, has been involved worldwide in digitizing newspapers. But there's digital collections uh, and in libraries there are more collections and they are the kind of the alternative you can use these to find even more details about your families uh, new zealand isn't that big of a place that uh, uh, the news in one section of the country wouldn't have made news in the in other sections so uh, it, and it helps that there are smaller uh, areas where there also were newspapers so it's it's a good place to look for, for the more interesting information, but it also can help you to confirm and, um, and flesh out, in a sense, the families so that what you have is more information about the details of the family's lives, uh, what they did for a living, uh, when they went to school, what they did in school, whether they participated in sports, all these kinds of things that come out uh, in the newspapers when you start looking into the into the digital newspaper uh, libraries. Now, if your ancestors happen to have uh, have be back into the Maori people, then uh, you'll find out that there's another set of documents and a lot of uh, the Maori history uh, during the time uh, when it was part of when it 
when the, uh, the British were in charge or that was a British based country, then uh, those records are the same as the other records for the country to some extent. But then as you go back in time, then you'll find out that the, the Maoris have an, an extensive uh, oral history. And much of that oral history has been preserved. And interestingly enough, a lot of it is on family search. Now, where would it be on family search? Well, if you go to the, the uh, family search research wiki page, then it will probably uh, give you a link to those records, which it, which it will tell you about and uh, where those histories and, and genealogies are, are uh, located. And they are on the familysearch.org website under the tag called genealogies. And if you go to the search tab, you'll see that it says uh, records, images, et cetera. And then it says genealogies. Well, that's what that, that's what that part is. That part is kind of the everything else that we couldn't figure out what to do with went into genealogies. And uh, you'll see that there are lists of different kinds of records in genealogies. And one of those is community genealogies. And that communities uh, include the Maori uh, records. Good news is the Maori records are there. Uh, kind of the bad news of that is that you have to start and get some names first before you can get into it because you need to know how it's structured and how you get into those records. And that's what this will tell you. This will start you explaining. Um, and there are over 4 million people in uh, New Zealand that are Maori. And, um, they, uh, and there are about uh, 250,000 that live in New Zealand and most live on the North Island. So there's lots of different people out there that are. Well, okay, I, I misspoke. There are about 4 million people in New Zealand and there are about 250,000 Maoris, sorry. So here's the beginning Maori research. You can go down through here and uh, see exactly and try to figure out exactly. And then there's all these different records. And it's showing you to go into the to the um, uh, into what kinds of records there are and where you want to uh, where you want to go. This is, is going to be something where you may, in fact, need to go actually talk to people. And um, uh, then you can go into and see uh, and contact, maybe you need to know about the people. Now, this is not abstract because one of my good friends over the years uh, happened to be Maori descent and her family had moved to New Zealand. And so she was doing uh, Irish and, uh, and Maori research. For many years, that was it. And it was a situation where this is all the things that she was having to, to uh, learn about and actually get involved in. So the important thing here is to keep looking. In other words, don't think you'll ever, don't, you know, it, it's, uh, it's always a mistake to think that you have not. Uh, that you don't have uh, any place else to go, that you've really, you're, you're through, you've found everything there is to know about your family. That is just, uh, it just can't be done. And uh, if you were, for example, if, if you were claiming that you had uh, finished looking through everything you could possibly think of and every relative you've ever could ever find, um, and all your lines were dead end because your family went to, lived in fill in the blank country, uh, someplace around the world. And, and so you just can't find anything there. I'll tell you what happened with some of my friends and they have what they have done after a little bit of discussion and uh, some a little bit of training. They have uh, basically, for instance, I have uh, friends who's, who's um, families come from Eastern Europe. 
And in, in some cases, what they've done is they'll go into the, the current directories for those countries that they can find, and they will take out the names of all their surnames. In other words, the names of their families, and then they will find places where those surnames of those families live. And then in, many, in some cases, in more than one case, they have uh, either through DNA testing or through um, MyHeritage or through one of the other programs, uh, some, you know, their own, their own efforts, they have found a cousin, someone in that country, and they have gotten on a plane, gone over and gotten to know their family in that country in Europe and or Australia or and in New Zealand or any place else. And once they get there, then they start collecting names. And, and uh, in some cases, I have been told that uh, uh, I remember one of my friends uh, was out knocking on doors looking for people who, who knew the surname and they were finally sent over to somebody who was the uncle or the grandfather or something. And he happened to have the entire pedigree of their family. And so there's just opportunities like that that are still out there and they're still available. Obviously, we're, we're very much restricted presently about our, our travel because of the pandemic, but uh, understanding that it, we're never really through. We can just keep going. And uh, one of the things that was put on hold for, in my case for the pandemic was my research in Rhode Island, which I was going to go last year to uh, my tentative plans to go to Rose Island and start looking in some local records, which I uh, was assuming have not been digitized yet. And so we're going to go look, uh, was going to do that and that never happened, but uh, it may still happen in the future. Okay, well, I think that gets us to the, thanks for watching. Uh, I realize this is a little shorter than some of the, the classes and webinars we've given, but, uh, with no census records that cut out a fairly large chunk of what you would talk about in a, in a country and in a, and what kinds of, uh, of uh, how that those census records uh, function and what they have and what they don't have. Uh, so you're really uh, looking at, at a lot of alternative records when you start uh, looking into what's going on in New Zealand.